Well, brothers, it is a joy to be with you again this morning. Hope you all got some good rest. Uh, go ahead and grab your Bible, if you would, and turn to the book of Psalm, Psalm 128. Psalm chapter 128. And as you're turning there, uh, I just want to thank uh, Pastor Philip and crew for that incredible gift he gave me last night. I was told his name is Henry. <laughs> well, Henry the, the Gator. And uh, we, were, we were discussing last night how uh, I might transport Henry back to Wyoming. And we talked about shipping it, but I insist that we take it on the plane. And of course, we got into the conundrum of you know, how TSA and the uh, flight attendants are going to feel about that. And we came up with a plan that old Henry the Gator is going to be my emotional comfort animal. <laughs> so if they ask, sorry, Mr. Davis, we can't take that. Well, you don't want to see me without Henry the Gator. I'll cause a problem on this flight. So, But it's so gracious of you all, man. And I want to just encourage you that we're all in this together in the battle uh, to embrace uh, God's kind of masculinity and be the kind of men that we need to be. Uh, in a decaying and a, a disgusting culture that hates uh, God and hates God's plan for men, uh, that God has graciously redeemed us by the blood of Jesus Christ, not by our works, uh, that God in his mercy has reached down to us and moved by his compassion from all eternity, not by our works, because our works are filthy rags, the scriptures tell us, and moved by his grace and his glory, he has picked us up and scooped us out. Why us, as Spurgeon said, well, well, I know not. I will never know why, but he has. And so he has called us by the grace of God, uh, by the eternal decree of the Father, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the regenerating power of the Spirit, all to the praise of the glory of God. And has called us to this hour, gentlemen, that we would embrace God's call for men. And we all fall short of the glory of God. Whether, we, whether we've been walking with God for a day or a century. And God knows, and God is sovereign over our growth and sanctification. But nevertheless, he would have us really put our hand to the plow and not look back by the grace of God as we feel our weakness and our wretchedness. And, and we loathe that as Paul did in Romans seven fourteen to 25. But nevertheless, that as Paul said, forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to lies what lies ahead. And so... May we do that and continue to do that uh, as brothers as we look to the scriptures to be God's kind of men, whether I'm just embarking on God's exalted call for biblical masculinity or I've been doing so for decades. We are in this together to serve our great God and the privilege is all ours to, to live for him and live for the glory of Christ. We will forever be unworthy of his grace and yet he is always with us to strengthen us for this call. So in Psalm 128, this morning, uh, I want us to begin. Last night we saw an exhortation. This morning we're going to see an invitation. And uh, our, in our, our third session, we're going to see a caution, an exhortation to, to really take heed, to, to not waste this opportunity that we've been given, uh, to, to turn away from a sinful lukewarmness, and make that decision by the grace of God to be and pursue hot devotion for Christ. This morning we're going to see an invitation for the man to live the blessed life of biblical masculinity. And then, Lord willing, afterwards we'll see a caution, a caution towards compromise. It's been wisely observed that the condition of a society is a commentary on how that society views masculinity. That you look at how does this society treat women, parent their kids, what's their view of sexuality, work, responsibility, and that will be an indicator on what they think of masculinity. Everyone thinks something about it, for better or worse. And the moral, spiritual state of a culture, of a nation, tells us what they think about the role of men. And it's no secret what our, na what our nation largely thinks about it. Uh, it's doing everything it can 
to tear down all that God says a man is to be and do. I mean, Satan has his crosshairs on God's view for his glory of masculinity, and he is just firing repeatedly at it. This is a day when Satan is on a crusade against masculinity, homosexuality, and transgenderism, which are really an utter forsaking of masculinity, are, are just shoved in your face from every sector, every sector of society. Why? To destroy the glory of God and biblical masculinity. But to get men to tap out from pursuing God's role for them. And really, you men understand that when you destroy biblical masculinity, you destroy the society. Uh, you convince men and you condition men to abandon God's kind of masculinity and you will destroy that people. You convince men to be passive, to, to put off marriage or be passive in your marriage or to take the view that, well, she's the boss. They commit themselves to video games, passivity, excusing their sin in the confines of their home, failing to repent and shepherd their wives to turn away from Christ and God, tell men they're victims, discourage men from becoming dads, shame them for worshiping Christ, and you demasculate them. The hatred of biblical masculinity is the hatred of God and the hatred of Christ in Scripture. Now, God created biblical masculinity for his glory. Uh, God thought of testosterone. God thought of male headship in the home and in society. And so we utterly reject any notion uh, of, of toxic, that masculinity is to toxic, that it's harmful to society. We utterly reject that. God created biblical masculinity for his glory. Man was the first that he created. He did this for the good of the world. Embracing biblical masculinity is what is best for society. You get men who lead, who love their wives as as Brother Zach uh, exhorted us to love our wives like Christ of the church, uh, to parent our kids as God calls to, raise them in the fear and admonishment of the Lord. And that is a great good for society. It's the greatest good. To promote biblical masculinity is to promote human flourishing and orderliness and uprightness of society. Dads are are given to be the stabilizing factor in the family. Gentlemen, we understand that a godly dad is the launch pad, and a godly husband in the home is the launch pad upon which the rest of the family gets lift off to fulfill their roles and flourish in what God would have for them, whether it's a wife, a son, a daughter. Embracing biblical masculinity places the rest of the family on that launch pad. And brothers, we need to recognize as well as just the, the evil of society can grind on you. It is not enough for us as men to be mad at the culture and their attempt to emasculate men. Yeah, we should have a righteous anger. Psalm 97.10, hate evil, you who love the Lord. But we, we mustn't stop there. That our anger at culture needs to result in action for the glory of God. Action in our lives to embrace and go against the grain of culture and even go against the grain of my flesh. Uh, to put my shoulder into this and put my hand to the plow in biblical masculinity. Perhaps like some of you, I was not raised in a home, any, anything near it, where biblical masculinity was embraced.
this journey. Follow along as I read then. Psalm chapter 128. A song of a sense. God's inspired, inerrant, sufficient word reads. How blessed is everyone who fears Yahweh, who walks in his ways. When you shall eat of the fruit of the labor of your hands, how blessed will you be and how well it will, will it be for you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the innermost parts of your house. Your children, like olive plants all around your table. Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears Yahweh. May Yahweh bless you from Zion, that you may see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Indeed, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Father, thank you for your word. We desperately need it. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us get traction in your word and to understand and to embrace and live out the implications in the various spheres of our lives. Help us to do so. In Christ's name, amen. This psalm was given by God to lay out for us, brothers, the foundational roadmap into biblical masculinity as well as to give a, to kind of lay out the blessings to say this is worth it. God is not only inviting us to take upon the hard work of being his kind of man, but he's saying, and listen, I want to bless you in this, and I will bless you in this, and I want you to see the abundant fruitfulness that I will give you as you embrace God's kind of masculinity. Notice to whom the psalm is addressed. If you look at the end of verse 2, just by way of introduction here still, he says, uh, how blessed, it, the, he'll bless, excuse me, the fruit of the labor of your hands. And then you get into verse 3, your wife, your children. So, of course, this is addressed to men, a working man, a husband, a dad. It's addressed to those, to, to the man, and assuming he wants to be the one who is not passive, who is not shirking responsibility, but he sees hard things that God calls him to, and he, he knows he is weak, and he knows he is wretched, but by the grace of God, he's going to step into, and step into the hard things, and he's not going to be afraid of, of resistance. He's not going to choose the path of least resistance, not because he has some cocky self-confidence and, and pride, but because he knows he has a, a God on his side who has created the world and wants to bless him. And so he's going to step into areas of life where he knows there will be resistance and pushback. And it won't always be uh, bluebird weather with a nice tea in his hand, as it were. But he's going to step into it as a man because God is with him. And because God has saved him. And God has called him to this holy task. Now, if you're an unmarried man or a younger man, this psalm is no less for you. It doesn't say, well, only for the married guys and the dads. No, the invitation here is for all men to take up the call to masculinity and experience God's favor and joy and blessing. There is joy to be had as we embrace this psalm, and we'll show you that more in just a second. Not only that, if you're a, a younger man or an unmarried man, the vast majority of men will be married, though that amount is decreasing today, consequent of the decreasing in masculinity. So this is a call for us as men to, to embrace all that God would have for us. Now, for some uh, hooks to hang our thoughts on, we're going to have two points. We're going to have two points. Number one, we're going to have the invitation, the invitation for men to receive God's blessing. And number two, the abundance for men of God's blessing. Number one, the invitation for men to receive God's blessing. And number two, the abundance. The abundance. Abundance of what? Of God's blessing for men. So brothers, I want us to see number one, the invitation. Number one, the invitation for us as men for God's blessing. 
This will be found in verse 1. The invitation. Look at verse 1. How blessed is everyone. Again, the focus is speaking to the man here. Wives, children. Sorry. How blessed is everyone who fears Yahweh or fears the Lord and walks in his ways. This is the invitation for every man into God's blessing. Notice that word, how blessed. Blessed. There is emphasis there. The, 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 the word is towards the front to emphasize God's delight and God's desire to bless the man who will step into his plan for masculinity. Blessed. The, the word has the idea of, of settled happiness. Not fleeting happiness that is only circumstantial, like, like the world seeking the next idol, but a settled happiness that is from God. The gift of divine joy put into the heart of the man. God's favor resulting in joy. So it's an invitation, really, to the good life. The joyful life. The happy life, and God knows that Psalm 128 is this side of Genesis 3. He knows we're not in Genesis 1 to 2. And he's saying, nevertheless, the thing that all men want most, and some do terrible things to achieve it, as I did in my unsaved state, happiness, joy, it is here. This is an invitation. Now, of course, we looked at last night that this all begins, this is not promoting some do-it-yourself, works-based salvation. This all begins with trusting in Jesus Christ and trusting in the Messiah, in Old Testament times, for reconciliation to God, for forgiveness of our sins, faith alone in Christ alone. That's the first step we all must make. Come to the cross and be saved. And this is where the invitation begins. So the opening words of the psalm, how blessed. Who wouldn't want that? Even unbelievers say that. I want to be blessed. I want to be happy. And so, brothers, we all want to be downstream of God's blessing. So the psalm sees man and his great desire is to have his work. This psalm will cover the area of the man's work, the fruit of his labor, verse 2. His wife, verse 3. His children, verse 3. Even his, his town, verse 5, his posterity, verse 6. Every man wants to have fruitfulness and blessing. E e even the rank atheist, in his heart, he, he wants to have a blessed life. If he has a family, if we have a family, brothers, all of us will want that our family would be walking in such a way so as to invite God's blessing in. So it's no coincidence that God chooses these areas. Work, wife, children, town or village, posterity. One of a man's greatest desires and greatest struggles is to have a job in a Genesis 3 world. God has wired men for this. I shouldn't say all men pursue this. To have a job where I'm settling into God's blessings. It might be hard. It might be very difficult. But that I know by God's grace that I am working as unto the Lord. And God is blessing me in it. And every man's desire in his heart of heart. God has wired men for this. To have such an influence on my family and on my wife that she would flourish in biblical femininity. And in humility. And in the high dignity of Biblical submission. That she, every man desires to have a wife who would not oppose his leadership. That she would not resist him. That she would not be the Proverbs 21 woman. The Proverbs 21 woman. In which it is said at multiple times, the contentious wife, it's better just to pack your bags and go live in the Judean desert where a, a cool day is 110 with the scorpions and the coyotes or better to live in the corner of a roof. Every man desires to have a respected headship in his home. 
I assure you, a hundred out of a hundred married guys, they do not care if they're saved or not. They do not want a contentious wife. They want a blessed home where there is order. Not to mention God wants this. One of the things that quietly discourages and deflates a man, perhaps more than anything, is a wife who, behind closed doors in the privacy of his home, she is arrogant. She is the modern woman. She is uncooperative with his leadership, resistant towards his headship. She's not a fruitful vine, but a, a scourging thorn bush. This is a deflating thing for every man. Some men kill themselves because of this, and it's not entirely their wife's fault. We'll talk about that. But there's something we can do to, to help that flourish. From the psalm, what is it we can do? What is it to get traction? What is it that we can boot the gates and the doors open wide of our house to have God's blessing invited in and, and rushing in? The psalm says one thing here, how blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Who fears the Lord. How do we get traction in this? There are wives to be dignified, biblical, feminine, Titus 2 women. The joy and freedom of the Lord to receive our leadership in the home. That we would not lock horns in the home to, to begin to embrace and step, encouraging one another in our various roles. We cannot force this. You cannot force your wife to do this. But there is one thing certainly we can do and we must do. Again, to get our, give our wives lift off in this. To turn away from the frustration and the secret chafing under my flesh of, of bitterness towards her, envy of, of other men, coveting other men's wives. How can we promote a fruitful vine and healthy olive plants? What's the first most important step in all of this and the continual step? Notice verse 1. It is to fear the Lord. It is to walk in his ways. Now, notice the, the generosity of God's invitation. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Notice it doesn't say, well, only those who, you know, they, they, they've been walking with God for decades and maybe they have a Bible degree or they were raised in a Christian family. None of that. It is an all-encompassing com, all com, <laughs> blessing, a catch net to everyone to fear the Lord. This is the generosity. There is no restriction. So, what is this? Fear the Lord, walk in his ways. Generally speaking, notice fear. Fear is the inward attitude, and walk is the outward action. You can say that. Fear is the man's inner life. It's his heart. Walk is the man's outer life. And, of course, fear produces the walk. Fear produces the walk. Fear is the root. Walk is the fruit. You cannot have the walk without the inward fear. They're interconnected, but fear is the priority. And, and the, the walk, the, the life in God, the Christian life, is always pictured as a walk. Paul does this too. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, Colossians 2, 6. It's a, it's a movement. I'm going to do something. I'm going to exert and overcome some inertia. I'm not going to take the path of least resistance. Pressure and hard stuff are okay. Fear. Now, a couple observations about fear. It's been wisely observed that whatever you fear will control you. Whatever can secure your fear can begin to, to govern you. And, and similar to the behavior of a society indicates its view of masculinity, so the behavior of society indicates what it fears. <clears throat> Excuse me. Everyone fears something. Our society is ruled by fear. Fear of what people think of us, fear of how we appear, fear of a virus, fear of health, fear of te terrorists, fear of societal collapse, fear of... Uh, there was an article in our local paper in Teton County not long ago, fear of climate change. Fear of climate change. Uh, the, the Jackson Hole newspaper was speaking of a safe place for discussing climate fears. 
where, among other things, the individual was mourning and sorrowful over things like private jet travel. There was a, a survey in the American Psychological Association that said more than two-thirds of Americans experience climate anxiety. A study published in The Lancet found that 84% of children, kids, and young adults, 16 to 25, are at least moderately worried about climate change, and 59% are very or extremely worried. How wicked. How sad. And that will control them. And that will not control them. The men they're in to have godly families. And it's interesting, despite many of these fears, many places in our world are safer and more comfortable than they've ever been in history. Right? So whatever fears you can control you, we saw that during the COVID experiment, that if you can make people afraid, they'll begin to abandon freedoms and they'll submit to Pharaoh and just walk in step. There, people will even be willing to destroy those, we've seen this elsewhere in society, who they think are a source of fears. Part of the reason for this pandemic of fear is because our world has turned from God and refused to fear him as the fitting and the only object of fear and reverence. Michael Reeves has an excellent little book on the fear of the Lord. I would commend it to you. Uh, it's a, a short read. He's observed that secularism and atheism lobbied to liberate the culture from what they viewed, the enslaving fear of God. They proposed that by doing so will result in human, li human liberation by throwing off the fear of God. However, this has not made society happier and less fretful, but quite the opposite. Where discomfort, he writes, quote, was once considered quite normal and quite proper for certain situations, it is now deemed an essentially unhealthy thing. It means that in a culture awash with anxiety, fear is increasingly seen as wholly negative, and Christians have been swept along, adopting society's negative assessment of all fear. Small wonder then, he writes, that we shy away from talking about the fear of God despite its prominence in Scripture. It is understandable, but it is tragic. The loss of the fear of God is what ushered in our age of anxiety, but the fear of God is the very antidote to our fretfulness, end quote. How helpful. The solution to lesser fears is a greater fear, to fear God. So there's this pandemic of misplaced fear <clears throat> that plagues us, fearing the wrong things. This isn't to say that we shouldn't be concerned with world problems and things of those nature, but misplaced fear is an abandonment of God's kind of masculinity, brothers. To forsake the fear of God is to forsake masculinity. There's a sense in which I, I was talking to one of my pastor friends recently, a, a dear man of God, and he said, Eric, he said, I'm scared of God. I'm, I'm scared of him. And he has a wife and his kids are grown. He's, he's saved. He loves Christ. He loves the compassionate and the gentle nature of Christ, but he also said, I'm afraid of what God would do to me if I should become even more proud than I am in my home and towards my wife and my kids and my ministry. And that's a, that's a healthy thing. You know, speaking of the demasculation of society, we have also been in the church demasculating Jesus. Where Sometimes books are written, taking, taking one phrase about Christ, being gentle and lowly, and then forcing that on the entirety of who he is. Much of the church today wants a feminine Jesus who isn't threatening to me, not threatening to my sin. He's just always kind of passively gentle towards me and, and my sin, and he's really no threat to my secret compromises of conscience, that's no Jesus at all. We are to fear the Lord right here. To have the blessed life, we are to have a fear of God. Flee the wrath to come, Scripture says. S. Lewis Johnson, the late S. Lewis Johnson rightly said, the fear of God and the terror of judgment is motivation enough 
to turn and surrender to Christ. Fear God. Now, there are other things that even we as believing men can be tempted to fear. Besides things mentioned, maybe, or maybe that's not an issue for you. We can be tempted to fear our wives. To fear our wives. Uh, to fear that our wives might disrupt the tranquility that we worship and that we've made an idol out of in the home. To fear that my wife might get upset at me if I do this or that or uh, try to shepherd her in something or bring up some issue. Fear that, that the, the calm waters of the serenity that often we as men make an idol out of in the home that will become stirred a little bit. A fear that maybe she won't let me engage more in my hobby that I want. Or free time. A fear that my wife won't be willing to have sex with me. Fear that she might get angry. A fear that might... Fear of having to move out of my comfort zone and be, frankly, be shown as very weak and needy before my wife, needy in the sense that I greatly need God's grace to step into this role of leadership and discipleship and shepherding that is difficult. Those are fears that believing men can experience. I have before. I've been tempted by all those things. Or we might fear our kids. Fear that if we discipline them or start to turn things by God's grace towards more of a, a, a godly commitment in the home and faithfully and obediently plugging in meaningfully to a local church and that might mean sacrifice of sports one of the great American idols nothing wrong with sports I love when my kids do sports but worshiping God as for me in my house we'll serve the Lord and as I by God's grace try to turn things to be more obedient but my family the junior might throw a fit and we as dads sometimes can fear that Junior might be angry, or fear of how I might be seen, I, I won't be seen as, as cool or as significant with other believing men on the team or in the village because we're not engaged, we're not as heroic in some of these activities that the culture has made a golden calf of. These are fear temptations, even for believing men. Fear of not having a certain status in front of the culture, a certain socioeconomic position, and so I lose approval. And sometimes we can say, well, if I, if I have this certain status and sports status of my family or certain socioeconomic status, well, and we can deceive ourselves, that'll give me an inroad to be more relevant and be a better witness. Yeah, that's what will happen, a better witness before the culture. We have to be very careful about that. We are to fear the Lord only. This is an invitation How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. Now, the antidote, the solution to not fearing our wives or not fearing our kids does not mean we are harsh and arrogant and some fallen over aggressive and wrong view of masculinity towards our wives. That's not the solution. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We're to fear the Lord. Now what the fear of God is not, it's not a crippling terror, of course. There's no fear in judgment, First John 4. It's not a fear that drives us away from God. The fear of the Lord is this. It has three aspects to it. Reverence, worship, and awe. Reverence, worship, and awe. The Dictionary of Biblical Languages tells us reverence in a sense of a, a, a state of respect and underneath submitted respect towards a superior towards someone who is far greater than you 
in power and in glory and in supremacy. Reverence. Worship. And also fear has the idea of worship in it. Showing devotion. Adoration. Obedience. Prioritizing. The first thing that gets into my schedule, that's worship. The immovable part of my, my calendar, that is worship. And awe. Fear is awe. Wonder. Astonishment. Where it's like, you know, sometimes when you, you, you come up to the, the, the side of the edge of a cliff and you kind of step back a little bit, Right? You keep a distance. You, there's a respect of what could happen to you if you approach this thing in the wrong way. So a, a, a holy scaredness. Yeah, I am scared of what God might do to me if I go off the rails. That is so healthy. That is absolutely so healthy. Reverence, worship, awe. A biblically informed awareness also of God's judgment and his wrath. This is what the fear of the Lord is. A, a healthy uh, terror of his wrath, his judgment, along with his promise to discipline us. And a great hesitancy to ever put the Lord to the test. Deuteronomy 6.16. Testing him. I'm not going to do this. What's God going to do? This is the fear of the Lord. Much of what biblical masculinity comes down to in the home foundationally is God is God and I am not. He dictates what I am to do with my wife, my children, the job, society, the church. The man of God knows that God is God and he is not. This is much of where manhood begins and wholeheartedly embracing that I am not God. I do not get to decide how things are going to go in my home and my schedule and so on. The fear of the God. Fear of God. Of course, fear of God is cultivated, brothers, by just taking lots of laps around the cross. Seeing, look what, look what had to be done because of my sin. Look at the greatness of God's love and his holiness. Now, are you saying that if we fear God, that everything in my life is going to perfectly come into order? Look, no, we cannot control many things. We cannot control how people at the job respond. Many of you have very difficult jobs. We cannot control our kids' salvation, our wife's salvation. We cannot control their, anyone's sanctification, though we can promote it. And just because I cannot control certain things about my wife, and my kids, nor should I even want to, the man of God doesn't throw up his hands and say, well, God's sovereign and, and, and there's nothing I can do about that. I'm just going to keep being passive as if we're more spiritual than God. No, we can do some things. Right? What's interesting is that most of us guys don't approach any other part of life like that. You know, take hunting, for example. We can't make the elk or the deer and, and the the type of elk and deer be where it needs to be. I wish we could do that, especially a novice hunter like me. There are many factors we have no control over in hunting, but that never stops a guy from hunting. But we do everything we can. We get the gear, we pray, we get out there, we strategize, we trust God, and that's the kind of approach we need to take with our homes by God's grace and masculinity. There is much we cannot control. But God right here gives the invitation, how blessed is everyone, is the man who does what? Fears and walks. So this tells us that the man can have and absolutely will have an influence in his home as we repent of all lesser and idolatrous fears and fear the Lord. And God says, you will have an influence. So the idea of, well, I can't change her and I can't change the kids should never be an excuse to let off the gas in fearing the Lord and walking in his ways.
in his ways. Fear has a God-given influence factor on the man's home and beyond. Now, sometimes you might say, well, I do fear the Lord, but that doesn't seem to work. And, you know, you, you, don't, you don't know my wife or my home or they're not a, she's not embracing First Peter you know, 3, 1 through 6, quiet and gentle spirit. She still argues. And that, that is possible. That is possible. This doesn't mean, you know, the, the first day I start, or even the first decade, I start fearing God that she's going to be zapped to be some female Jesus. And we're no male Jesus either. We are to do this, not worshiping some outcome, but for the glory of God. Because God deserves that we be God's kind of man, regardless of what happens in the home or outside the home. That is one of my mentors used to tell me, Eric, your life in the home, you are to live your life as a man of God. Your life is to be a thank you card to God before your wife and before your kids and let God cause, cause your obedience to have an influence as he wishes and as you are on your knees praying for. So before we say, well, I've done that, it's not working, we ought to ask ourselves some questions. Are there areas in our life where we can grow in the fear of God? Have we perfected this reverence and awe and fear of the Lord in our life? How long have I been setting an example of the fear of the Lord in my own family? Is there, what, what compromises of conscience might I be making in the fear of the Lord? Are there areas of my thought life that would evidence, eh, there's, there's some room for growth in your thought life in the fear of the Lord? Do the direction of my thoughts and my eyes, where they go, do, does that fear the Lord? Does that show that I fear God? All lesser fears are idolatry, brothers. It's idolatry. It's a breaking of the first and second commandment at least. What we fear, we worship. Psalm 29, or Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. It, it brings a snare, it, it traps us. It prevents you from moving forward to walk in his ways. How blessed is the man who fears always, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Do we entertain sin in our thoughts and have no fear of God? Do we have a high view of ourselves? We praise ourselves in our thoughts and don't catch and crucify that by the fear of God. Listen, the fear of God too in Proverbs, the, the, I, I should say the opposite of the fear of God where there is little fear of God. Proverbs says here's one great way you can tell there is little fear of God in your life. When you are not receptive to spiritual correction from other godly men or even from your wife. The, the, if you do a, a study of the fool or the scoffer in Proverbs, the one who he can't take a spiritual punch, he can't receive spiritual reproof, he, he's, he, he's, like a, he's like a spiritual, he's like the spiritual uh, disciples of Mary Poppins. He needs a spoonful of sugar to help the spiritual medicine go down. He's a spiritual Goldilocks. He's like spiritual glass jaw Joe. He can't, he can't take spiritual correction. Why? It's not because the, the scripture gives one reason. Because he doesn't fear God. He's proud. He's a scoffer. That's a, a great barometer. A great litmus test. To little fear of God. Well, I'm supposed to lead my wife and she's supposed to submit to me and listen. Of course. Absolutely. But she, is all, she also is your helper suitable. And we need to have a humble heart to listen 
to her correction as we lead before God. Fearing God means receiving spiritual correction. Little meditation on the truth of God's word also is due to the fear of God. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. Well, that's the invitation. The invitation for the man to God's blessings. Number two, the abundance. Not only the invitation, but there's an abundance for the man of God's blessing. We've talked a lot about this. The abundance, number two, of God's blessing. This is the rest of the Psalms, verse 2 to 6. Verse 1 was the invitation. Verse 2 to 6 is the abundance of God's blessing for the man. We'll say, you know what? Lord, I, I need to grow in this. I still struggle in this. I, I, need, I need the cross to, to cleanse me of the ways I've failed. And thank you, Lord, that there is mercy and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I need your help. And God lays out, and he showcases these blessings. So kind of God. So merciful of him to, to put out a buffet of blessings. This is what I delight to give you. I'm just going to read. Look, at, look back at the, at the psalm, verse 2. When you shall eat of the fruit of your labor. This is the man's work. So notice, work, family. God goes through all of these essential spheres of the manly life. When you shall eat of the fruit of the labor of your hands, your work, how blessed will you be? And how well will it be for you? Notice he doesn't say, once you get that dream job, once you get that job that you like. Brothers, this side of Genesis 3, it's okay to have a job that you don't like and that isn't super glamorous. That's just kind of how work is. That's, that's the result of the curse. Thorns and thistles. Even as a pastor some days. It's like, this is... <laughs> Wow. They're Genesis 3 and thorns and thistles are in this work too. Right? It's okay. But notice, you'll be blessed in it. Not that everything outwardly will go well, but you'll have that settled joy that the world is just looking for and greatly desiring, but goes to all the wrong places. God says, I want to give you that. Not only the job. Verse, again, verse 3, your wife will be like a fruitful vine. Wow. It's a picture of, of life, of production, of health, vitality, stability, a fruitful vine, making the, the home a refuge, every man's desire, the, the blessing of a godly woman, not a perfect woman, but a woman who sees this is what God has given me to do, to be a helper suitable to my husband to compliment him and his, his ministry and his job and his life. Notice God holds us out for us, a fruitful vine. God says, uh, you can influence this in your fear of me and be a catalyst in my hand to bringing this about. Also, your children, in verse 3, like olive plants all around your table, Again, life, vitality, production, putting work in and seeing the fruit come and, and progressive growth is the idea. And we're patient and we know that, you know, a three-year-old shouldn't act like a five-year-old. But we can't expect a three-year-old, excuse me, to be as mature as, as a five or a ten-year-old. And, and our teenagers, we have patience with them, knowing how we were when we were teenagers. Wow. So we have patience, and fear causes that patience. As I fear God, I, I'm, 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 I'm slow, I'm gentle with my kids. I, I'm hesitant to explode. By the way, a fear of God is a, great, is a great restraint on anger. For a lot of us dads, it's a great temptation to get too easily, sometimes we say, frustrated. That's anger with the kids. Impatient. The word patience in the New Testament means a long way from wrath. That fear of God is a leash to pull us back. Who am I to get angry? If God and his God has turned all of his judicial anger from me onto Christ, it's amazing how 
slow to anger he is with me. Your children will be like olive plants all around your table. Sometimes it takes olives, olive plants a while to grow. They don't just grow overnight. Right? They, they say that a, a vine, uh, the, those who you know, grow grapes and produce vineyards, they say that it, it's really 7 to 10 years and up to 15 years before you start getting a, a good harvest, a maturation of that vine. A lot of work. A lot of work. Again, we're not doing this saying, I better get the product I want. She better start submitting to me. They better start saying yes, Daddy, and obeying me right away. Yes, those are good things, but it's for the glory of God. I let God produce the results. Verse 4, for behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. It's just this emphasis again. I promise you, you will be blessed, God says. It's not going to look the same for everybody, but there will be an influence of towards vitality and spiritual fruitfulness. Not only his family, look at verse 5. May Yahweh bless you from Zion that you see the prosperity of Jerusalem. This is speaking, I think, of two things here. His, his influence in the community and his influence in the corporate body, the, 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 the life of believers in worship. He'll be a, have a godly influence in his church and a godly influence in town as he fears the Lord. Who wouldn't want that? To be an influence in those spheres. And not only that, verse 6, the man's legacy. His, his posterity and his legacy. Verse 6, indeed, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Grandchildren, if the Lord allows. Others you influence outside of your family. These are the spheres of life that God and his word see as chief for a man's concern. His work, his wife, his kids, his, his body of worship, the people with whom he worships, his town, and posterity as the Lord gives. We can all have this influence. This is the abundance of blessing for the man of God. By the way, these, these are the areas, verse 2 to 6, are the areas that God lays out that say, these should be, these should be the areas that you pursue in life and pray in life for blessing and the greatest involvement and investment. Right? My job, wife, not necessarily not priority, right? In that, in that order. And nevertheless, these are the areas where I want to seek and invite God's blessing. My home, my work life, posterity, in the town, and in my church. So much more could be said, but this is the abundance of God's blessing. The prerequisite being the invitation, and brothers, by God's grace, that we step into this invitation to have this fear and awe and reverence and worship of our Lord, that by his grace, we would have this influence upon these spheres that God has entrusted us with. Father in heaven, we thank you for not leaving us guessing what we ought to pursue and prioritize in life. We know that this isn't a guarantee that everything will be thorn and thistleless in the home and with our marriages and family and work. But it is a promise of that inner blessing, the heavenly favor that you delight to give to the man who will embrace Biblical masculinity and the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Father, the are areas where we have failed in fearing you. We've feared unworthy things. Would you forgive us? And thank you that the cross cleanses us. Thank you that there is mercy. In these areas where we have struggled, would you give us grace by your spirit? through the power of your word, through the accountability of the church and other men. Help us to grow. Father, I know I need to grow in all these areas in fearing you. Help us all to grow. And I pray for your blessing upon our, our marriages, those of us who are married, that our wives would be 
like fruitful vines or children, those of us who have them would be like olive plants, even grandkids in here represented, great grandkids. Where we work, would you give us blessing? Would you give the men blessing? Or churches or towns, would you bless us, help us to have a godly influence in a wicked culture? It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.